أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين المنتجبين أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد آتينا داود منا فضلا يا جبال أوبي معه الطير وألنا له الحديد أن اعمل سابغات وقدر في السرد وعمل صالحا إني بما تعملون بصير صدق الله العلي العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقطة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته The theme of these nights has been looking at various legends in the history of Islam analyzing the lives, the biographies, the stories of these personalities and from their struggles crystallizing some of the key messages that we can learn from them spiritually and that we can also apply to ourselves practically. And inshallah we will continue in that vein of thought in tonight's discussion by looking at Nabi Dawood alayhi salam. But in order to speak about the story of Nabi Dawood it's important to understand the context of his coming. So we'll begin the story slightly before he grows to prominence. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tests us in a variety of ways. And some tests we expect, or we see a certain difficulty and we understand it's a test. For example, privation, poverty. Everybody thinks when we don't have very much, when we're struggling materially, that's a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us in Surah Al-Mulk, verse number 2. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنْ وَعَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created death and life to see whom amongst you are the best indeed. So we recognize this. But then there are some tests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends our way which are unexpected. That we don't necessarily recognize as tests. And uh, the fact that they are somewhat hidden is part of the test itself. So let's take the opposite to poverty, wealth. When there is abundance, that is also a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We wrestle with the issue of privation, sometimes even trying to take it on as a theological issue. But how often do we complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the test of wealth? Very rarely do we appreciate the fact that it is indeed a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when we have everything, when we live in ease, then we become soft. Then we start to make mistakes. It's the classic old picture, when, whether you look at individuals or you look at empires. We look again towards Ibn Khaldun's cycle of empires, that uh, various people would rise up by virtue of the virtues that they had ac- accumulated over times of difficulty. They had some sort of edge because of that privation. They rose up. They would displace any established kingdom which had lost itself in its own decadence. But then they too would become rich. And when they became rich and they had everything that they needed, they would become soft. And then again, 
they would be replaced by another nation that rose up in difficulty. That's why one of the early Mongol policies was to send uh, the uh, Mongol royals to the front lines, or not necessarily to the front lines, but to the steppe, to experience the difficulty there. And the same thing happened to the Banu Israel, because after Nabi Musa السلام, had freed them, they lived in relative ease. They were winning everything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he had given them a legendary Ark of the Covenant, which we will return to shortly, what this Ark, what this chest was. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he favored them, and they won battle after battle. They won everything that they encountered until they became a victim of their own success because they began to lose respect for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had bestowed them because that's what the test of wealth does. We lose vision, we lose sight, we lose appreciation for the blessings that we have because we assume that they are the norm and they are commonplace. And eventually they were defeated by the Philistines and they had loss after loss until they were a disparate people, humiliated, subjugated, starved, and often kidnapped. And it was in this state that they remembered to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because indeed that is one of the benefits of privation, we remember God. So they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send a prophet to them. Now Allah doesn't always, he doesn't name every single one of the prophets that he addresses in the Quran. When we look at the Bible, the name appears to be Prophet Samuel. So the people, they approach uh, their prophet who was eventually sent to them, and they ask them, to send for them a king that they may fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Surah Baqarah, verse 246. And note, they had to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send their prophet, number one, but they also had to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to appoint their leader. They had that understanding. And we'll return to that theme a couple times in tonight's discussion. And their prophet, he foresaw their weakness. And he asked them, well, when it comes to the moment, when we are fighting, will you turn away? And will your courage fail you? And it was an emotional question. And they answered logically. They were playing the, the, the wrong language game, to use Wittgenstein's terminology. So what happened? They responded by saying, well, why would we turn away? Because we've lost everything. We need this help. This will establish us again. But of course, they uh, did turn back on their word, as we will go on to see. But it's important sometimes that when we, uh, when we have certain problems in our own lives, that we address it with the appropriate tool that someone might come to us with an emotional appeal. And to simply use logic in those moments, it won't work. If someone, for example, is going through loss and difficulty, to talk purely in logical, cold terms doesn't necessarily help. And if someone comes with a logical problem, you try and answer emotionally, it doesn't work. So the calibration is key. And, and their, their prophet saw that, and he addressed it, but they were not willing to accept. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he records in verse 247, That their prophet said to them, Surely Allah has raised for you Talut as a king over you. And this is the equivalent, again, we see a similar story in the Bible, in the book of Samuel. And Talut, according to the biblical description, was a man of great physical prowess. And they objected. Again, in this verse, all of these details are in these verses near the end of Surah Al-Baqarah. They ejected. And they said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can he hold kingship over us while we have a greater right to kingship than he? He has not been granted an abundance of wealth. So there were two, when they were thinking about a king, they had two main ideas. One was that they should be rich, someone of reputation, and number two, someone of good lineage. That was their sort of concept of a king. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebuked them. Allah continues in the verse, he said, Surely Allah has chosen him in preference to you. He has increased him abundantly in knowledge and physique, and Allah grants his kingdom to whomsoever he pleases. And Allah is ample giving and knowing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he appointed a leader. They voted against the leader. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that your vote is irrelevant. And in this verse, he gave us three basic conditions. Uh, he gave us three qualities of a leader, a Quranic leader, in terms of a, from a theological perspective. Number one, that they are chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah grants kingdom to whomsoever he pleases, number one. Number two, the other general condition is about knowledge. 
and that was very specifically highlighted in this verse, that he is superior in knowledge. Those are the two general conditions. And the final specific condition, which was relevant mostly to this scenario, was that he was, uh, he was superior in physique. He was a very powerful man. And that was important for that moment because the purpose of this king was to take them to war. So under those circumstances, it was uh, essential. And after they had this leader appointed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he continues in, surah, uh, in verse number 248. And the Prophet said to them, surely the sign of his kingdom is that there shall come to you the ark in which there is tranquility from your Lord. And the residue of the relics of what the children of Musa and the children of Harun have left, the angels bearing it, most surely there is a sign in it for those who believe. And it's a recurrent th theme in the Holy Quran that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he sends prophets, he does so with evidence. Why do prophets come with miracles? One of the reasons is in order to convince them, to show them why they believe what they believe in. None of the prophets come and ask for blind faith. And we just see that as a side point. Whenever we look at the uh, different messages when they come, they use different tactics. They argue rationally. They use logic. They try and appeal to them culturally. They use miracles from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of which this was one of them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, the master of psychology, he understands that these people, the Banu Israel, this chest, this ark to them was the stuff of legend. Because in their mind, all of their success, all of their victories, all of their grandeur of old was connected to this chest. So when they saw it returned to them, it reignited the fervor to return to the times of prosperity and of ease. And it was that evidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had provided. But what was this ark of, uh, of Musa alayhi salam? What was this a chest? Well, we get the answer from the Quran and from a hadith. We'll start with the Quran. The first is an implied uh, definition of this ark. And we find that in Surah Taha, verses number 38 to 39. When the mother of Nabi Musa, alayhi salam, we revealed unto thy mother what was revealed, put him in a tabut and cast it into the river. Put him into, the, into an ark, into a chest, and put him into the river. So when the mother of Nabi Musa alayhi salam, when the Pharaoh was coming after them, as we discussed briefly in the story of Bibi Asya on the first night, he was put in an ark and put onto the waves of the river Nile. And he was allowed to float away. And the same word that is used here is used when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the ark of the covenant. So that's the implied, is probably the same chest. But specifically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives some details. In that verse, in verse 248 of Surah Al-Baqarah, he says that in this chest, there are the relics of the children of Al, of the family of Harun and of the family of Nabi Musa alayhi salam. And from the ahadith, we get some more details. That in it were some of the stone tablets of Nabi Musa alayhi salam, some of the armor. Yushha bin Nun, he inherited the chest, who was the successor of Nabi Musa alayhi salam, because his brother Harun died before him. And one after the other, they would pass the chest down, and the prophets and kings that would come afterwards, their sacred relics would be put inside of this chest. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has codified this in the Holy Quran as well. And it has a special power, this chest as well. Again, in the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Surah Baqarah, verse 248, Allah says that in it there is a sakina from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a tranquility. So not only was it something psychological that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was giving, but it was also something with a great physical power as well. The spiritual prowess of this object had real world physical consequences. But over time, as we read in Hayat al qulub in a variety of traditions, over time they lost respect because they won victory after victory after victory and then they got used to it. They no longer respected these relics. And when you disrespect the relics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he takes them back. So over time, in this tradition, one tradition in Hayat al qulub even the children, they would sit on the side of the road and they would uh, play with the relics. They had no importance afforded to them, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the tabut away from them until he would give it back again to, uh, in order to establish the kingship of Hazrat Talut. And it's important to note about the relics, about the importance of relics. 
because it is somewhat of a contentious issue when you look at, particularly uh, if you look between various schools of Islam, about the concept of relics, especially in uh, Muharram, we are in the, the, the month of Muharram, there are certain relics or uh, copies of relics which come out, or sometimes when we go on ziyarat, we go and we pay our respects to the graves of uh, the Imams, and there are often relics which are present in those places. And from a Quranic perspective, they are an established phenomenon. It is not a bid'ah, it is not something which has been made up after the Holy Prophet. Just to establish this, we already have that clear verse from Surah Al-Baqarah, but a few more verses. In Surah Ali Imran, verse number two, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, la tuhillu sha'a'ir Allah. O you who believe, violate not the sanctity of the symbols of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah Baqarah, verse 158. Behold, Safa and Marwa, those two mounts that we visit on uh, our Umrah and on Hajj, they are of the symbols, the signs, the relics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Fakhruddin al Razi, in his Tafsir al Kabir, under commentary of this verse, he writes that the signs of Allah are to be revered and paid with, uh, and paid with veneration. That whatever symbols and signs are made to represent the invocation of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they constitute the signs of Allah. And Allah has given an example in the mounts of Safa and Marwa. In another verse of the Holy Quran, Surah Baqarah, verse 125, And take from the standing place of Ibrahim alayhi salam, maqami Ibrahim, a place of salah. He takes the sanctity of the place where Ibrahim alayhi salam would stand and he makes it a place of prayer, of salah. That if anybody was to say that, that use of any sort of relic or a holy place is tantamount to shirk, then the maqam of Ibrahim would be the height of shirk because it's a place of musalla, of salah. But again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishes it in the Holy Quran. And the most famous example in the Quran is in Surah Yusuf, verse number 93. Now, Nabi Ya'qub, when he lost his son, Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam, he cried until he lost his eyesight. And Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam, when his brothers came to meet him, he said to them, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Surah Yusuf 93, Take my shirt and cast it over the face of my father, and he will be able to see and bring me and your family all together. Now Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam is a prophet. He simply could have raised his hands, said dua, Ya Allah, please give the sight of my father back. But no, he makes a point of it. He takes his shirt, he gives it to them, and he shows that not only is something associated with the holy personality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala important by way of association, but it has its own spiritual reality and its physical effects. A very well established in the Quran. And when we go for Hajj, when we go around the Kaaba, we go towards the Hajar of Aswad, the, the black stone, which is in the side, uh, in one of the corners of the Kaaba. And there are some who, who question this. There's some who perhaps they don't fully appreciate the, the level at which these relics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kept. For example, in Sahih Bukhari, book, uh, in Sahih Muslim, book 15, hadith 274, or in Jami' Tirmidhi, book 4, hadith 860, one of the companions of the Prophet, he goes to Hajr al-Aswad, he kisses it, but he says, he speaks to the stone, and he said, if I did not see the Holy Prophet kiss you, I would give you no importance whatsoever. But there is a misunderstanding, there is a disconnect, because the Hajr al-Aswad is one of the relics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have that psychological power, but they have the physical power and the spiritual power as well. Now, of course, there are boundaries, there are lines, there is fiqh, there is jurisprudence that surrounds these things. That we, number one, of course, they are not independent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not that the shirt of Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam was working independent of God. And why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given barakah to these items? Why? Why not simply uh, something more direct, right? It is, from, it is you that we worship and from you that we seek aid because these relics, they are associated with something or with someone. 
like the Ta'bud of Nabi Musa alayhi salam. It connects those people to their prophet of old. Or you take the land of Karbala. It connects us to Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Why is that important? Not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs these conduits, billah. for Allah is needless. By definition, He can have no requirements, but they are there because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, Oh Aba Abdullah al Hussein, you have given so much in my name, I will make the dirt from where you are slaughtered somewhere holy and a place of visitation. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. And they continued, uh, they had gathered under Talut, they had gathered an army, and they were brimming with confidence. I mean, what more could they have wished for? They have a prophet with them, they have a king with them, one who is chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is very powerful and imposing. They have an army of thousands, and most importantly, they have the Tabut. They have this Ark of the Covenant. What could possibly come in their way? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers, water. Because he decides to test them. Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will always test in times of ease and in times of difficulty. So in verse number 249, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has recorded the full details there. But essentially, when they came to this river, when they were on their way to fight Goliath, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I know you're tired in the desert, don't touch the water. I've given you everything. I've given you a prophet. I've given you a king. I've given you the Ark of the Covenant. All I ask for you is not to touch the water. Don't drink from it. And if you must drink, drink no more than a handful. So what happened? Uh, most people can probably guess. They threw themselves in the water and they drank to their fill. The overwhelming majority of them. And a small minority of them, they picked a palmful and they only drank what Allah allowed them. And an even smaller minority still said, we are not going to touch the water, we obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is, this, these details are in the verse of the Qur'an and also in a hadith. This is the hadith which I'm using is from Usul al-Kafi. And what happened next? There was a consequence. Those who drank to their fill, they had shown a lack of faith. And so when they were confronted with the prospect of facing out against Goliath, they had lost their courage and they ran away. They deserted. And according to this tradition in Al-Kafi, there were only 313 left. And the rest continued. Tiny army now going against the armies of Goliath. And when they stood and they faced him, the ones who had taken a palmful, they said a words of doubt. They said that now we will not be able to defeat Talut. We will not be able to defeat Jalut, that is Goliath. Their, their courage failed and they hadn't run away, but they did not see themselves as being victorious on that day. And it's interesting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in that categorization, it's almost like he's giving us a template for mankind, right? You can almost take this as an archetype for every single trial that human beings face throughout history. You will get most of them who will fail. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. Then you will get some who, who don't fail, but tentatively. They just about pass. And then finally you get those who, the tiny minority, the smallest minority of all who hold, who hold to the truth. And those who had not drunk, they recited what was then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he codified in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. كَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلٍ غَلَبَتْ فِئَةً كَثِيرَةً بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ How often it is that a small party has defeated a greater party by the leave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They had tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It didn't matter who was on the battlefield. It didn't matter even if it was Goliath himself. They recognized that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was on their side. And when we trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we lean on the Almighty, we reach into the limitless well of power that will never leave us disappointed. To Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed a hadith Qudsi, which is recorded in Al-Kafi about tawakkul. He says, any one of my servants who relies on me heartily, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking, then the heavens and the earth may plot against him, but I will provide him an exit away from their plots and plans and machinations. 
but for the one who seeks help from my creation. I will cut the rope that links him to the heavens, and he will sink under his feet, and I will not care where he perishes. If we seek other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that means ultimately, that for example, when we consult a doctor, that's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking here. It's talking about that ultimate connection. We realize it all comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if we do tawakkul on someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are doomed to failure. Allahumma salli In verse 250, they prayed uh, a, a archetypal prayer. They said, when they went out against Jalut and his forces, they said, our Lord pour upon us patience, make our steps firm and assist us against the unbelieving people. They asked for patience, they asked for courage and victory, which was a combination of the two. But where was Nabi Dawood alayhi salam? Well, according to a tradition in Hayat al qulub Nabi Dawood wasn't even with the army because he had been left behind. He was the smallest, he was the meekest of all of his brothers. And there was a prophecy that Talut had received, that he had known via his prophet, that the one who would defeat Jalut would be the one who Nabi Musa alayhi salam's armor would fit. And so assiduously he was checking on all of his soldiers, which one does the armor fit? And the father of Nabi Dawood alayhi salam came forward, he offered all of his sons, and Talut said, do you have any other sons? And he said, I have one more, but I left him behind, he's no soldier, he wouldn't be able to fight. Talut said, let's be meticulous, go and get him. So they sent a messenger back to the camps to go and find Nabi Dawood alayhi salam and bring him to the battlefield. And what a beautiful parallel we can draw here. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen his warrior, nothing will get in the way. At the battle of Khaybar, when Rasulullah says, tomorrow I will choose a warrior and a leader who loves Allah and his messenger and Allah and his messenger love, who comes? Imam Ali wasn't even in the battle, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. But of course they plan and Allah plans and Allah is the best of planners. And so, Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, he comes. Champion versus champion, one on one. And what a comedic scene it must have seemed. On the one side you have Goliath, a proverbial giant, a behemoth, someone who could not be defeated in battle. And on the other side you had a meek young shepherd. And when Goliath saw his opponent, he laughed. And again we draw this parallel with Imam Ali alayhi salam. Because at the battle of Khandaq, when he faced off against Amr ibn Abdul, what happened? He faced off against the Goliath of Arabia. The man who was legendary for not being able to lose a battle. And who laughed at the beginning saying, I've seen you grow up, you're just a boy, I won't fight you. And Imam Ali alayhi salam says, if you oppose my prophet, I will fight you and I will defeat you. And of course, that's exactly what he did. So Daud, he stands against Goliath. And Goliath has whatever weapons he has. Dawood doesn't even have a sword. He has a sling. But with one strike, with one throw from this sling, the pebble pierces the forehead of Goliath and he collapses to the ground and his army disintegrates out of fear. And subhanAllah, again, we return to this sort of concept that has been a theme throughout the night when we have looked at the biographies of all of these uh, wonderful personalities. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he intervenes, the flood of Nabi Nuh or the destruction of Ad or Thamud, they are a rarity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't normally work that way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he works in the realm of probability. A divine wind in the background, a small intervention here or there in order to restore the Banu Israel to their place of, uh, of grandeur. What did he use? A simple stone from a shepherd's sling. Indeed, innaka ala kulli shayin qadir. So after Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, he had established himself, he would later become the leader. And we read in Tariq al-Kamil by Ibn Athir that it was after the leadership of Talut. So Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, he then took upon himself the leadership of the uh, Banu Israel. But again, just on the notion of leadership from a Qur'anic perspective, again, who is it that makes Nabi Dawood alayhi salam leader? It wasn't the people. Even though they had seen his prowess on the battlefield, they didn't vote for him per se. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an 
that he made Nabi Dawood a Khalif. Surah 38, verse number 26. O Dawood, surely we made you a Khalifa in the land. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah 24, verse number 55, God has made a promise to those among you who believe in good deeds. He will make them Khalifas. To the land, like he did to those before him. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, you will find no change in his sunnah. So from a Quranic perspective, we would argue that leadership in every example, there are no exceptions in the Quran when there is someone who is appointed by leadership, if there is someone in the position of leadership from the side of Islam or from the side of truth and justice, they were chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, he had a profound status, spiritually and historically, he was used as, as an example for the Holy Prophet to follow. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Sa'd, verse number 17, he addresses the Holy Prophet, bear patiently what they say, and remember our servant Dawood, the possessor of power, surely he was frequent in returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was established spiritually, he would pray for long periods of the night. There are a number of traditions that talk about the fact that he would fast every other day. He was established physically. He then became a very powerful warrior after his exploits against, uh, against Jalut. He also was foremost in knowledge and will come to see his judgment shortly. And in all of these different ways, and obviously politically as well, he was unrivaled. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him quite a unique miracle. He gave him the power of metallurgy without the need of heat. So he says in Surah 34, verse number 10, we made iron soft for him. And again in the 34th Surah, verse number 11, Allah says, make coats of armor and measure the links well. So Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, he was able to manipulate metal without heating it. It was like soft wax in his hands. And it's interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about Nabi Dawood, Nabi Dawood, he established himself, he, he first rose to prominence in the battlefield, and he established his kingdom through a number of wars. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he describes what Nabi Dawood alayhi salam makes, he doesn't describe swords, he doesn't describe spears, he doesn't describe arrows, he describes armor. It is defensive. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about war in the Quran, it is a defensive enterprise, not an offensive one. So the types of armor that he made, some people have said it was chainmail. It probably doesn't fit historically. Chainmail came a lot later. So more likely, it was a form of armor that allowed greater mobility around the joints than what previously existed, a sort of technological advancement. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, in Surah 34, verse number 11, he asks Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, do good, uh, all of you, for I see everything that you do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing his king. Allah is addressing his khalifa. Allah is addressing his prophet. And he tells him that when you make the armor, make the best that you can possibly make. And there's a couple of intriguing elements about this verse. The first is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us an important point. That whatever we do in life, we do to the best possible standard. When we go to school, for example, we should be at the top of our class as far as is possible. When we enter into the workforce, we try and leave a mark. We are not simply happy with the status quo. We don't simply follow guidelines, but we should be the ones that write them. And we use Nabi Dawood alayhi salam as that inspiration to rise above the ordinary, to rise above the mediocrity of the average rat race and become special and establish ourselves both in a worldly sense and also for our akhirah as well. Allah. But the other element of this verse, which I found truly beautiful, is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives us this message. Now throughout the Quran, for those of you who've had the honor of reading it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will give us lessons in a number of different ways. Because there are so many different types of human beings and in different times of our lives, and also from people from various different psychological backgrounds, they will respond to different things. So in multiple places in the Quran, Allah will threaten us with punishment. He will describe quite graphically the torments of hell five to try and scare us into the right way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often describes heaven in order to coax us towards the right way. 
Sometimes he will argue with us. Sometimes he will reason with us. Sometimes he will, uh, he will try and implore us to come towards the truth. But one of the most beautiful techniques that he uses in the Quran is here in this verse. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to Nabi Dawood, telling him to make the best that he can. This is Nabi Dawood alayhi salam. Of course he's making the best that he can make. He's not going to take it easy. This message is not for him. This message is for us. But sometimes when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing us, He does so in such a compassionate fashion that it pierces the hearts. Let me give you an analogy. Imagine that you have two kids who are making a little bit too much noise or they're quarreling. And one of the, one of the children is your own, but one is a friend's child. Now, it's a slightly difficult situation because you can't tell the friend's child under normal circumstances to be quiet. Stop making a fuss. So what you'll do, even if your child hasn't done anything wrong, you'll turn to your child, you say, look, please, let's, let's keep it quiet. And the other child will recognize indirectly that I, what I was doing was wrong. And this is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us this message. And he uses this multiple places throughout the Qur'an, especially when he's talking to the Holy Prophet. There are some verses in the Qur'an we read, we think they're a little bit harsh to the Prophet. But Rasulullah is Allah's beloved, he is Habibullah. Allah has no harshness for the Prophet. But it is there as an indirect reminder to us, one of the many ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala peels back the layers of our psychological makeups. Allahumma Muhammad. And he was implored, Nabi Dawood he was told to make armor as well. That was one of the reasons for his miracle. There's a tradition in Majma'ul Bayan where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you are a good servant, but you take, your, uh, you take your wage from the treasure. And by this, Nabi Dawood understood that instead of making his livelihood from, his, uh, from the stipends he would get from government, instead he was supposed to do so via manual labor. And there's a lesson for us here as well. Because Nabi Dawood as king of the lands, he had risen above. And remember the concept that I mentioned at the beginning, that when we are in ease, when we have things going our way, if we sit back, we have, alhamdulillah, may Allah bless us with a job that pays us well. Sometimes we get a little bit lazy. We sometimes disconnect and we forget what it is to be humble. If you go to work every single day and you have lots of people working for you, working under you, you never have to get your hands dirty. And you can become arrogant. And it's not necessarily something which is unpredictable. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, get your hands dirty. Do not forget your humble origins. And engage in manual labor that you can remember. I'm not advocating a form of volunteerism, which leads to people doing a sort of a, a, an inefficient uh, sort of jobs abroad sometimes that you see. But what it refers to is to take time out to volunteer. And one of the greatest places to do that is in the masajid. Because when we go to these Islamic centers, number one, they are a place of barakah. Every single thing that we do here that we help out, even especially in the majalis of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, the traditions that tell us the amount of reward that we would get, even if we were to donate, one tradition in particular talks about one sugar cube, the kind of blessings we get from that. But aside from that, it keeps us humble because we clean up the mess. We throw the rubbish away. We set things up. We engage in these menial tasks out of the love of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. And that is why, if you go to the Rosa, for example, of Imam Rada, alayhi salam, do you know the people who are serving? The people who serve you there, the people who take your shoes, do you know who they are? They are surgeons, they are rocket scientists. They are the high flyers of society. So Ajib, what are you doing taking my shoes? They line up for months in advance because they want the honor of looking after the shoes of the zawar of Imam al Rada. Indeed, they follow in the footsteps of Nabi Dawood. And he was, of course, famously, he was given the Zabur. That was his revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Isra, verse number 55, And your Lord knows best about whatever is in the heavens and the earth. Surely we favored some prophets over others, and we gave Dawood alayhi salam the Zabur. 
And when Nabi Dawood السلام, used to recite the Zabur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he captures it. There's a few verses in the Quran where he describes it. One example, Surah 38, verse number 18 to 19. Surely we made the mountains sing to the glory of Allah in unison with Dawood from the evening till the sunrise. And the birds gathered all around reciting with him. Can imagine the sight. Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, he sits alone. He opens up the Zabur. He recites with such a beautiful voice that the mountains and the birds and the trees and the earth itself recite the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alongside him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this was a, a sort of a subject we touched on last year, but a, a quick passing point. When we look at the universe, it is alive in a religious sense. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Isra verse number 44, the seven heavens and the earth and everyone in them glorify Allah. There is not a single thing that does not celebrate Allah's praise, though you do not understand their praise. He is most forbearing, most forgiving. When you look, for example, at the climate crisis, or you look at issues of plastic pollution or carbon footprints, we are destroying this earth. But not only are we burning our own home, the only home that we have, we are also killing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Baqarah verse number 30 that he has made Nabi Adam a khalif on this earth. And we are the khalifs following in Nabi Adam's footsteps. We are to look after this earth that we have been given custody over. And when Nabi Dawood used to recite, that covert recitation and praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would become overt for all to see. And Nabi Dawood, he was famous for his judgments. That he would pass a number of judgments in his court that... Uh, were, that became the stuff of legend. And this was what he spent much of his time doing when he was a leader. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah 38 verse number 20, and we strengthened his kingdom and gave him wisdom and gave him a clear justice. For example, in Hayat al-Qulub, there's a tradition that Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, show me your justice. Allah says, you won't be able to take it. But more importantly, the people of Banu Israel won't accept it. Nabi Dawood insisted. So the next day, when uh, the first litigant came, there was an old man who came dragging in a young man who had in his hands uh, a amount of grapes, small bunch of grapes. The old man said, he came into my property, he ransacked my property, he stole my grapes. Nabi Dawood asked the young man, is this true? The young man said, yes, I broke into his property, I stole his grapes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed to Nabi Dawood, you want my judgment? Execute the old man, give the whole of the gardens to the young man, and tell him to dig at this particular part of the garden. People of Banu Sarahir say, well, what's going on? He was the one who the crime was committed against, and he's the one who has to be executed? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the old man, many years before, he murdered the father of this youth. He stole his land and he took his wealth and he buried it in this part of the garden. And that was the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he showed. And Nabi Dawood was often the conduit of this justice. But Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, he also committed a tarq al awla now, we went into a little bit more detail in the talk about Nabi Yunus alayhi salam. But it's sufficient to say here that in the school of Ahlul Bayt, we argued that the prophets of Allah and the Imams were infallible. In that they had the ability to commit sins, but they would choose not to. So when it, we come across something that appears like a sin, we don't call it a then, but it's not a sin, it is a tarq al awla They have left the best possible option. They have gone a little bit below, but not below enough that it becomes a sin. And Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, he had the most minuscule one of these. In Surah Sa'd, verses number 21 to 22. And there came to you the story of the litigants when they made an entry into your private chamber by climbing up the walls. When they entered upon Dawood, he was frightened. And they said, fear not. We have, one of us has acted wrongfully towards the other. Therefore, decide between us with justice and do not act unjustly. Guide us as per the right way. 
Now, for those who are listening to this, it's a bit, it's a bit peculiar, isn't it? Nabi Dawud he would normally he would sit in his court. People would come. He had himself. He had his system. He was comfortable. He knew what he was doing. He would take time to think about things. But these two litigants, they have climbed the walls of his private chamber. They have climbed inside to the extent that Nabi Dawud thought it might be an assassination attempt. And it's interesting, just on a side note, how weak we are physically, how delicate this thread of life is. And that Nabi Dawud, this great king, all of his kingdom could collapse by two people who sneak into his room. You know, there's a, a parallel story with Salahuddin, the conqueror of the Shia Fatimid Empire in Northern Africa, the winner of the Third Crusade against Richard the Lionheart. He wakes up one day, there's a dagger next to his head, there's a note which says, if you want to live, you leave us alone. It was from the Hashashin, the assassins of Alamut. And Salahuddin didn't go near them. He didn't dare mess with them. And that's how delicate our physical bodies can be. And, and the irony of power. The more that we garner, the more delicate it becomes, and the more we are scared of losing it. So the case goes on. Surah Sad, verse number 23. This is my brother. He has 99 sheep. And I only have one sheep. And he has decided to take my one sheep. He made his mission, and finally he has been successful. He has 100. He has left me with nothing. Now, Nabi Dawood, alayhi salam, he made a quick assessment. Now, uh, for those who are more, we don't have time really to go into it right now, but for those who are interested in the two different types of thinking, uh, thinking fast and slow. It's the, the best way to differentiate between the affect heuristic, which looks at quick decisions we make emotionally with less energy, versus the rational decisions we make after spending time reticulating. But uh, for those who are, who are interested. So Nabi Dawood, alayhi salam, in this abnormal circumstance, he makes a comment. He doesn't pass the judgment, but he makes a comment. Surely he has been unjust to you in demanding your sheep. To add to his own, most surely of the partners have acted wrongfully towards one another. But he had made a mistake. Why? Because he hadn't listened to what the other person had to say. And he had passed a comment. Again, it wasn't the official judgment, but it was an inappropriate comment nonetheless. A heartbeat of a mistake, and immediately Nabi Dawood realized, and Dawood was sure that we had tried him. So he sought protection of his Lord and fell down bowing and prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah. And sometimes we look at infallibles, right? We look at prophets, we look at imams, and we think, you know, it's so easy for them. Right? They have that connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have revelation from God. And here's me, lost in the depths of my own ignorance. But look at the standard that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is holding them to. One line in abnormal circumstances. And according to some traditions, these two people were angels that Allah had sent deliberately to test Nabi Dawood. He slips up only momentarily and he has committed a tarqa al-awla. And he feels miserable about it. He leaves his, his court, he leaves his room, and he walks around, lost in his own uh, moroseness. And in his walking, in his wandering, he comes across a cave. And in the cave, there is a hermit. And this is recorded in Ayn al-Hayat. That hermit, that devotee to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was a man called Hizqil. And he asked Hizqil, he said, Oh Hizqil, have you ever thought about sinning? Hizqil, he said, no. This thought never crossed my mind. He said, oh, Hizqil, have you ever thought about being proud of your immeasurable devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He said, no. I've never felt proud. He says, oh, Hizqil, have you ever thought about enjoying this dunya? He smiled. He said, that one, that one I have thought about. So Nabi Dawood asks him, he says, well, what is it that you do? in these circumstances, when you are tempted by these thoughts, he says, I, I enter that chamber. Nabi Dawood, he went into that chamber. What did he find? On the floor, there was a skeleton. The skull of the skeleton was resting on a slightly elevated stone. Next to it, there was a tablet. And inscribed into it, carved into it, were these words. I am Arwai bin Shala. I ruled for a thousand years. 
I established a thousand cities and I married a thousand women. But my condition is this. My bed is dust, my pillow is a stone, and my body is a cesspit of vermin. Take this as a lesson for anyone who thinks that they will be taken away by the attractions of this dunya. There's a similar, there's a poem to, to this effect. It's called Ozymandias uh, in English for anyone who's interested in, in looking at that as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he respected his return. And uh, he says in Surah uh, Saad, verse number 25, Therefore we rectified him for this, and most surely he had a nearness to us and an excellent result. And when we talk about the, uh, the uh, forgiveness of prophets, of infallibles from the Shia perspective, it's not that they have committed a sin, but either one, they have committed a tarq al-awla, but even if they haven't committed a tarq al-awla, they recognize the gap between what they can do and what Allah deserves. And it's Imam al-Sajjad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who alayhi. As he said, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if I could thank you for everything, how could I thank you for the breath that I used to issue this shukr? There is an accusation which is leveled against Nabi Dawood alayhi salam. It is more, it's given in more detail in the Bible, and there are some books which contain a, a semblance of it. Tabari and Suyudi are our two in particular. We don't have time to go into, uh, into the details, but it's enough to quote Imam Ali alayhi salam, that he says in Bahar al-Anwar, if anybody comes to me and said that Nabi Dawood committed X crime, I will enforce two punishments on him. One for insulting the position of prophethood, and one for making an unjust accusation against a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, in his time, he was also raising Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam. Lots of traditions, again, we don't have terribly much time. Lots of traditions where he would pass his wisdom on to his son. And we would see that wisdom come in Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam. In Surah Anbiya, verses number 78 to 79, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And Dawood and Sulaiman, they gave judgment concerning the field when people's sheep pastured therein at night, so they were bearers of witness to their judgment, and we made Sulaiman understand this. So, long story short, there was a complaint that came to Nabi Dawood alayhi salam. There was a man who owned a field of crops, and there was a man that owned some sheep, a shepherd. The shepherd's sheep had gone across to the crops overnight and they had eaten them all. And then they had gone back to uh, the farmer's land. They came, they complained, Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, he thought, he thinks, well, this, the farmer has destroyed the livelihood of uh, the, the one who owns the crops, so his livelihood should go to him. But Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam, he intervened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on this occasion, not saying that Nabi Sulaiman was wiser, but on this occasion, he was given the wisdom, and he said, rather, O Father, should we not say this? Rather than depriving one man of their livelihood, take the sheep, give it to the owner of the crops, while the farmer is regrowing the crops. And once the crops are in their former state, allow the farmer to have his sheep back and give the crops back to uh, the, the man who owned the land. And this way, they both managed to preserve their, uh, their shares and their livelihood. And Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam, he was of course the successor of Nabi Dawood alayhi salam. In Surah Naml, verse number 16, we read, وَوَرِثَ سُلَيْمَانُ Dawood." And this is of critical importance. These three words. And Dawood alayhi salam was succeeded by Nabi Sulaiman. Why is it important? For two reasons. One, again, we've been talking about leadership a bit during this discussion, that when you look at any leader who has established a nation or a kingdom or a people or an ideology, it is of the paramount importance that they choose a successor. Or if not choose a successor, at least give us a system of successorship. So when the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi When he has told us how to fast, how to pray, even how to go to the bathroom, for him to stay silent on the issue of leadership after him would be grossly irresponsible, number one. But number two, another reason it is of critical importance is, it bec is because this verse of the Quran, it shoots down one of the slanders against Ahlul Bayt. 
because Lady Fatima to Zahra alayha salam. When she had the land of Fadak, which was given to her during the Prophet's lifetime, when she had that land, it was taken away from her under what pretense? That prophets do not leave behind inheritance. This was the supposed hadith. What is the first step in verifying a hadith? The first, ignoring the fact that it is against Lady Fatima to Zahra, a Siddiqah, the truthful one who never told a lie. The first condition is you compare it against the Quran. We take that supposed hadith, we put it against this verse of the Quran, and it collapses. 